Good afternoon, everyone. It's not very many times that you remember where you were when you read a particular scientific paper. I remember where I was when I read Takahashi and Yamanaka in August of 2006. I was at the beach. I was supposed to be uh, getting away from the scientific hubbub, but I heard there was this paper that really ought to be looked at. And there had been stories flying around in the rumor mill that a Japanese group had come up with a truly surprising and, and dramatic way to reprogram cells, but the details weren't uh, known, at least not by me. And now here was this paper in Cell. And as I read that paper, I literally uh, had the hair stand up on the back of my neck because I f could see that this was transformative that what Shinya Yamanaka, our speaker for today, and his postdoc had figured out was really going to allow us to study development in ways that we could not previously have imagined uh, from individuals whose phenotype we would be able to determine <coughs> because they are individuals walking around. At least that was my supposition. Now let me not get ahead because that paper described doing this in the mouse. And it was another year after that in papers from Shinya Yamanaka and Jamie Thompson independently showing that this could also be done for human cells. And so the era of the induced pluripotent stem cell was born uh, on that particular strength of science produced by this remarkable scientist who we're going to hear about, uh, for, hear from today. Shinya Yamanaka has a fascinating uh, scientific personal uh, trajectory as well, having uh, been someone trained as a physician and as a surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, and who in his typically modest way he describes as not having been a particularly successful orthopedic surgeon, but that's not something I've heard from anyone except him, and I suspect he was probably better than he admits, but it turned out not to be his calling, and uh, aren't we all the better for that? I'm sure orthopedic surgeons are the worse for that, but we're the better for that. Uh, Shinya then went on to get a PhD. Uh, did a postdoc at the Gladstone, got interested in mouse models and development, and in a series of elegant experiments after he had gone back to Japan, uh, came up with this strategy, which I suspect he will outline for you, that identified the way in which one could take a differentiated fibroblast and convince it to become pluripotent with the transfection of just four genes. Who would have guessed it was going to be that straightforward? Now, of course, it's not that straightforward. And the whole field of iPS cells uh, has been uh, an incredibly active and exciting area and continues to be. And in fact, Shinya is here to help us tomorrow uh, with a discussion we're having about iPS cell biology and uh, the ways in which we might, in, here at NIH, in the intramural program, uh, make some additional contributions uh, to the flowering of this field, particularly in the ways in which it may affect translation. So it is a great pleasure uh, to be able to welcome uh, this scientist uh, to the podium today. He has been honored in quite a number of ways, receiving the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Prize. And here in the US, as you probably know, he won the Lasker Award, America's Nobel, uh, last uh, fall, and the Canada Gairdner International Award as well. And I think there are few of us who would doubt the fact that he will enjoy a trip to Stockholm uh, sometime in the not terribly distant future, given the way in which this observation has uh, emerged as perhaps one of the most exciting developments in science in the last decade. He is currently uh, going back and forth a bit uh, between Japan and uh, California, about his main appointment, is uh, director for the Center for IPS Cell Research and Application at Kyoto University. He continues to conduct groundbreaking IPS cell research with a couple dozen of researchers and students aiming to try to move this field in the direction of regenerative medicine. So it is my great pleasure and privilege uh, to ask you to help me uh, to welcome to the podium Professor Shinya Yamanaka. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Francis, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And it's a great pleasure.
to be here today, and it's a great honor. I, I'm so impressed that this lecture started on time. <laughs> <laughs> this can never happen in UCSF, <laughs> so I'm so impressed. So in my talk today, I'd like to share with you the history and the potentials and some challenges of induced pluripotent stem cells. So let me start with the history of myself. So I did my post postdoc in, in the States, in San Francisco, in, in the mid-90s at Gladstone Institute. My boss at that time was uh, uh, Tom Inenariti, and it's me and Tom. And the main purpose of this slide is to show you that I had more picture, I, I, I had more hairs <laughs> in these days. So, uh, during my postdoc training, I worked on RNA editing of apolipoprotein B mRNA. Uh, ApoB is, one, is, is the major protein component of uh, uh, LDL, which is essential for plasma cholesterol or metabolism. And two forms of ApoB protein is produced from a single ApoB gene by a mechanism named ApoB mRNA editing which is a post-transcriptional modification of uh, uh, one cytidine to uridine. This editing generates a new stop codon in the center of uh, ApoB mRNA, resulting in a shorter form of ApoB protein named ApoB48. This is a cytidine deamination uh, mediated by an enzyme uh, which we designated APOBEC1. So this is the hypothesis of Tom, my boss at that time. He thought that if we overexpress this enzyme APOBEC1 in liver of mice and human, we should be able to lower plasma LDL cholesterol level. So he expected that we may be able to use this gene in a gene therapy to treat patients suffering from uh, uh, plasma high cholesterol and also uh, atherosclerosis. To prove his hypothesis, this is our strategy. We decided to generate transgenic mouse line over expressing this uh, APOBEC1 gene in a liver specific manner. So, as, uh, 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 as just like many Japanese postdocs in NIH, I worked very hard. I worked seven days a week. And uh, uh, experiments went very well. I got uh, these transgenic mouse line within six months. But one day, uh, one of the technicians of Tom, who was working with me, uh, early in the morning, she came to me, and she said some, something strange. She told me that uh, Shinya, you are mice, many of your mice are pregnant, but they are male. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, was, I was confused. <laughs> I, I, was a, I was a physician. <laughs> so I knew only female can, pre can be <laughs> pregnant. So I went to the mouse facility and I saw my mice, but they did look like being pregnant. So I sacrificed some of those uh, 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 male mice, and I, I found, instead of uh, 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 baby, I found uh, this huge liver in those mice. So it turned out that APOBEC1 is, a, is an oncogene. So we can never use this gene in gene therapy. That would be a, a crime. So from this uh, uh, experiment, I learned three important rules in science. Number one rule is that science is surprising. It's, uh, it's difficult to uh, predict. It's very interesting. That's probably why I'm still doing science. The second rule is that we should never try new procedures, new medicine, new genes directly on patients. 
It's too, too dangerous. We should do animal studies. The third rule, which may be the most important rule, is that we should not believe in your boss's hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tom very naturally he got disappointed by this result. But I got very excited about this result. I really wanted to study how in the world this uh, RNA-18 enzyme can cause these ugly tumors. And Tom was kind enough to allow me to continue uh, uh, studying these cancers in Gladstone Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. So I was very grateful to him. So I spent uh, uh, almost three years to understand what's going on in these tumors. And I found that uh, other, another mRNA besides ApoB, uh, I'm sorry, besides a ApoB is extensively edited in transgenic mouse liver. In normal liver, in normal mice and normal human, the specificity of ApoBec1 is ex extremely high. Uh, one cytidine in ApoB mRNA is the only one known target of ApoBec1 in normal situation. However, in transgenic mouse liver, I found that this new gene, which I designated NAT1, is extensively edited by overexpressed ApoBec1. And this editing result, results in uh, generation of numerous stop codons in the middle way of this uh, NAT1 mRNA. I generated uh, antibodies to this uh, NAT1 protein, and I found that in transgenic mouse liver, NAT1 protein almost disappeared. So here's my hypothesis uh, at that time. I thought that loss of function of this new gene, NAT1, may be responsible for tumorigenicity by ApoBec1. To uh, prove my own hypothesis, I decided to make NAT1 knockout mice. So I learned how to culture uh, mouse ESLs, how to uh, target uh, NAT1 gene, and how to make chimeras uh, by uh, Dr. Bob Robert Faris in, at Gladstone Institute, who, who is one of my best friends. And again, I worked very hard, and experiments went very well. I got my uh, targeting construct within two months, and I got targeted ESLs, and I got chimeric mice. But at that time, my wife did something uh, terrible. <laughs> she went back to Japan with my daughters leaving me behind. <laughs> <laughs> so my boss, Tom, uh, became very happy <laughs> because I can work much harder. <laughs> work and work. So uh, I uh, spent six more months in the States working probably too hard and I kind of uh, gave up, and I decided to go back to Japan. But Tom, again, was kind enough to allow me to bring those chimeric mice. I brought three chimeric mice uh, uh, to Japan. So he allowed me to continue uh, this research, NAT1 research. So I found that NAT1 is essential for the early mouse development. NAT1 now mutant mouse uh, uh, embryo die right after implantation, as shown in this slide. So because these mutant embryos are too small, uh, I cannot study the function of NAT1 anymore using these mutant uh, embryos. So I decided to knock out NAT1 in ES cells, in embryonic stem cells, because I knew that NAT1 is highly expressed in ES cells as well. So again, uh, experiments went very well. I got NAT1 minus minus, now ESLs very quickly. And I found that when undifferentiated on feeder cells, uh, NAT1 now ESLs looked okay. They proliferated okay, and their morphology looked okay. 
However, when I tried to induce differentiation by removing feeder cells, I noticed marked differences in that NAT1 now ES cells could not differentiate at all, even without feeder cells, as shown here. So as you know, ES cells have two important properties, rapid proliferation and pluripotency. I found that NAT1 is essential in pluripotency, but not in rapid proliferation. So up to this point, ES cells are simply, to me, a tool for generation of uh, knockout mice. But because of this uh, 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 unexpected uh, uh, results, the role of NAT1, uh, I got very interested in the biology of ES cells itself. So ES cells become a target of my uh, research. So uh, I got very interested in the biology of mouse ES cells. But after spending a few years in Japan, after uh, going back uh, from the States, I e e suffered from a disease, a mental disease. The name of the disease is uh, uh, PAD. Uh, this is NIH. This is the center of uh, health in the world. So uh, everybody should know PAD. But probably no, because this is the name I, I named. <laughs> <laughs> PAD uh, stands for post-America depression. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a terrible depression. So uh, when I went back to Japan, I only had three chimeric mice. But after two months, I had 50 mice. After six months, I had 200 mice. After one year, I had 400 mice. And I had to take care, take care of those 400 mice all by myself. <laughs> I didn't have any money to hire technicians. So I had to change cages twice a week. Uh, I have to wash all, the, all those cages by myself. And the medical school I went back was, was very good in clinics. But at that time, it was not so good in basic science. So nobody e, e, could understand what I was doing. They, they, were, not interested, they were not interested in uh, mouse, basic biology of mouse ES cells. So I was often told that, Shinya, you should do something more related to medicine. So because of those reasons, I got very depressed, and I, uh, I was about to quit science. But very luckily, two, two things happened which rescued me from PAD. The first thing was the generation of human ES cells by Jamie Thompson. Because of this, I learned that ES cells are very related to medicine. By using ES cells, we may be able to treat those uh, many patients suffering from various diseases and injuries uh, by uh, cell transplantation therapy. However, th at the same time, ES cells have many uh, hurdles as well. We have to worry about rejection after transplantation, and we have to use human embryos. So many people were and are still against the usage of human uh, ES cells, including your uh, former president. So uh, he was uh, 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 strongly against the usage of human embryos. So I, I, from Jamie Thompson's work, I learned that human ES cells could be very useful, but at the same time, they have many, many uh, challenges as well. The second event which rescued me from PAD was uh, uh, my new appointment in uh, Nara Institute of Science and Technology. I was recruited as a, uh, as a PI, as an uh, associate professor. So I got my uh, uh, first own laboratory. So this institute is, has very good scientific environment, just like many US uh, institutes. 
and they have many good uh, scientists, uh, many good, they have good scientific, scientific fundings, and most importantly, they have many, many good graduate students. However, uh, the system in this institute for students is that uh, there are like 20 uh, uh, laboratories in biomedical uh, institute. And every year, uh, they have 120 new graduate students. So there is a competition between laboratories for new students. And it's student's choice. It's not our choice. Students can select which lab they want to go. So because uh, as a newest PI, as a youngest PI, and as a poorest PI, <laughs> I was not sure if any students get interested in my laboratory. So I, I thought I should have some very attractive, uh, very uh, good long-term goal of my laboratory so that I can attract new students. Because of that, I uh, think I thought very hard and I made this a long-term goal of my laboratory. So I tried to make ES-like stem cells not from human embryos but from uh, somatic cells like skin fibroblasts by means of reprogramming. So uh, in April, in Japan, uh, school starts in April. So in April, in front of 120 new graduate students, I told that, well, this is the goal of my laboratory. If this, we can make it, it's wonderful. We can overcome the problems of human ES cells and we should be able to help many, many patients. Of course, I knew that this is very difficult. Uh, it, it would take 30 years, 40 years, or maybe forever. Of course, I knew that, but I didn't tell that to, to those new students. <laughs> <laughs> I only told my, my dream. So very luckily, I got three <laughs> students in my laboratory, Kazu Takahashi, Eiko Kaiho, and Yoshimi Tokuzawa. So these are the very first students uh, in my lab, and they are now uh, a treasure of my, of my life. So with these students, I, we worked very hard. This is my hypothesis. I, I thought that by uh, introducing factors that maintain pluripotency in mouse or human ES cells into somatic cells, we may be able to induce pluripotency. Based on this hypothesis, we decided to understand how pluripotency is maintained in mouse ES cells. And this is what we knew uh, in 2000 when we started this project. We knew that RIF is essential in mouse ES cells. And in 1999, STAT3 was identified as an essential downstream target of RIF in mouse ES cells. Two additional transcription factors, SOX2 and OX34, which are specifically expressed in mouse ES cells, are also or, 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 or indispensable in the maintenance of pluripotency in mouse ES cells. So these are very famous players. However, uh, I did not study these very famous players because I, I thought it's too competitive. As a very small new laboratory, I thought we cannot compete with other uh, bigger laboratories. So instead of studying these famous players, we try to identify new players which are not listed in this slide. So Yoshimi, one of my first students, she identified uh, KLL4 as a downstream target of STAT3. KLL4 is also a transcription factor. And we, with Yoshimi, Eiko, Kazu, and some uh, technicians, 
in addition to KLL4, we were able to identify some other factors which are listed in red by uh, 2004. Other laboratories were also working on uh, pluripotency in mouse ES cells, and they identified other factors which are shown in uh, pink. So by 2004, we had good numbers of factors that play important roles in the maintenance of pluripotency. So they are uh, good candidates for factors that can induce pluripotency in somatic cells. Then we needed a simple and sensitive assay system to evaluate this candidate. And it turned out that one of the 24, oh, in the previous slide I had 24 candidates, but it turned out that one of the 24 factors, FBX15, which we uh, originally identified as ECAT3, uh, uh, it turned out that we can use this gene as such, a, uh, such an assay system to evaluate these candidate factors. Uh, this was done by Eiko, another uh, first student. So we identified this gene as one of genes that are specifically expressed in ES cells. Eiko found that uh, FX15 is directly regulated by the two essential ES cell transcription factors, OX34 and SOX2. He has the sequence of uh, of the FBX15 enhancer, uh, there are binding sites for OCT4 and SOX2 next to each other. Because of these, this specific expression and because of this direct regulation by OCT4 and SOX2, we predicted that this gene should be important in mouse ES cells and early mouse development. So we, we decided to make uh, knockout mice of FBX, FBX15 Again, Yoshimi and uh, my first technician, Tomoko Ichisaka, did this project. Uh, instead of deleting, simply deleting FBX15, we decided to knock in the neomycin resistance gene into the FBX15 locus. So it's kind of a promoter trap strategy. So Yoshimi and Tomoko did a very good job we got uh, chimeric mice, and we also got heterozygous mice. And I told Yoshimi that we would not get homozygous mutant mice by uh, crossing heterozygous mice, because we believe, believed that this gene should be essential in early mouse development. However, we found that FBX15 is not required in mouse development. Those knockout mice were just healthy. I told Yoshimi that, well, well, I knew this result. <laughs> 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 but you should make knockout ES cells. You cannot make knockout ES cells. This gene should be essential in ES cells. There may be some uh, overlapping uh, gene in development, but this gene should be essential in ES cells. So she tried to make a knockout homozygous mutant ES cells, and she did. We found that this gene is uh, dispensable in uh, ES cells. They look just fine, and they proliferate just fine. Uh, I didn't have anything else to tell her. <laughs> <laughs> So knockout mice were healthy, and knockout ES cells were just healthy. Only uh, Yoshimi became very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> so you, usually, in, in, in such a case, without any phenotypes, we usually close knockout mouse lines, because it's a waste of time and waste of uh, spaces. However, this is the very first knockout mouse line uh, I generated back in Japan. So it's, it's very special to me. So I, I couldn't just cross the line. And I, I thought very hard uh, any other uh, 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 usage of these mice. And in, it turned out that these mice are extremely useful in 
evaluating those candidate factors. First of all, it's very easy to maintain these mice because homozygous mutant mice were just healthy. Because of Neo knocked into the FBX15, which is very specifically expressed in mouse ES cells, we found that somatic cells like fibroblasts derived to these knocking mice were sensitive to G418 because they don't express FBX15, they don't express Neo. By contrast, we found that ES cells from these mice do express FBX15, so they do express Neo, and we found that these ES cells are resistant to very high concentration of G418, more than 12 milligram per ml. It's kind of waste of money, but we tested, but we could not cure these uh, cells. Because of this finding, we thought that we, sh we expect that we should use these cells uh, from these mice uh, to evaluate those candidate factors. So we isolated MEF and we confirmed that these MEF are sensitive to G418. Then we introduced those candidate factors by means of retroviruses into MEF and we expected that if some of these candidate factors do induce pluripotency, do make ES-like status from MEF, those cells should become G418 uh, resistant. We did not expect complete reprogramming, complete uh, conversion to ES-like status, but even partial reprogramming should be sufficient to make these cells resistant to normal concentration G418. That's what we expected. So in two year 2004, uh, I'm sorry, in 2005, I moved to Kyoto University with these 24 candidate factors, with uh, this assay system, and most importantly, with some uh, important people like Kazu and Tomoko. Tomoko. But however, uh, Yoshimi, who developed this assay system, did not move with me. She graduated and became a postdoc uh, in some other laboratories. So instead of Yoshimi, I asked Kazu, Kazu Takahashi, to take over this project and to evaluate these 24 candidates by using this uh, assay system. Well, we, I knew this uh, project was still very risky, but very luckily, Kazu had a, uh, his first paper in Nature a few months ago. So I thought he, he would be okay uh, for the next two or three years without having any paper. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I asked him. So he, he was very happy to know that he can take over this project. And very naturally, he uh, tested one factor, one by one. <laughs> and uh, not too surprising, surprisingly, we, he could not obtain any G418 positive colonies by expressing each of the 24 candidates, as you can see here. So uh, I told Kazu, Look, Kazu, I told you this is a very good assay system because we don't have any false positive. <laughs> <laughs> then, Kazu proposed a very uh, stupid question. He said, uh, Yamanaka sensei, I want to mix all the 24 retroviruses. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> I, I'm very proud of myself who did not stop that experiment. <laughs> so he simply mixed the 24 retroviruses and surprisingly, he did get G418 resistant colonies. I asked him to repeat this experiment again and again and he always got a 10 to 20 G418 resistant colonies. He picked up these colonies and he found that these cells are very similar to mouse ES cells in morphology, in proliferation, 
in gene expression and most importantly in pluripotency. So we found that some combination of the 24 candidates can actually induce pluripotency in MEF. Then the next important task was to uh, narrow down factors to determine which combination out of the 24 fa four factors is actually required. It was, I thought it was very difficult because we didn't know how many out of 24 are required. It can be two, three, four, five, six, ten, ten, twenty. So we cannot, we could not simply try all the combinations. It was too much even, even for Kaz. But then Kaz proposed this time very uh, uh, genius experiment. He, he said, he wanted to remove one factor out of the 24 factor, one by one. So, for example, in this case, he removed the number one factor and transfect the remaining 23 factors. So there are 24 combinations. So when he transfected all the 24 factors, he obtained like 30 G418 colonies. However, when he removed one factor, this is what he, he, he obtained. So uh, we learned that by removing one of these four factors highlighted in red, he could not obtain any G418 resistant colonies. Well, when he removed number 22, which is CIMIC, he did get some G418 resistant colonies, but they did not look like ES cells. And when he, he picked up those colonies, he could not maintain those uh, uh, cells. So we thought this number 22, CMIC, is also uh, indispensable. So of course, he then uh, transfect those four factors uh, together into MEF and confirmed that these four factors are essential to generate uh, ES-like cells from MEF. So uh, through these experiments in 2006, we were able to show that uh, by introducing these four factors, OX34, SOX2, KRL4, and CMIC, we can make ES-like stem cells from mouse fibroblast, not only from MEF, but also from adult tail tip fibroblast. So we designated these cells, uh, IPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. Next year, we and others showed that we can make human iPS cells with the same or a slightly different combination. Now, we and others have shown that CMIC is not uh, essential. We can make iPS cells without CMIC, but uh, without CMIC, the efficiency is much, much lower. So we are now generating iPS cells from uh, many patients suffering from various diseases. All we need is a, a, a small procedure, skin biopsy. Uh, a group in Salk and uh, in Spain, they showed that we can make iPS cells even from a single hair uh, follicle. So in the future, we may be able to avoid this small procedure. However, uh, to some people like me, a single hair means a lot. <laughs> so I would do skin biopsy. But for some patients, uh, hair may be more convenient. But from, at the moment, from skin biopsy, we can uh, make skin fibroblasts. And by introducing those three or four factors, we can uh, generate iPS cells. And we can, as iPS cells, we can expand these cells as much as we want. Then, after expansion, we can induce directed differentiation into uh, various types of cells, including uh, this kind of beating cardiac myocytes. So these cells used to be skin cells just a few months ago. But now they are beating. So it was very, very remarkable. 
So when I first saw this uh, uh, beating heart, I, I was really impressed. My, my heart really synchronized with these beating cells. We have generated iPS cells from many, many uh, uh, Japanese and other uh, individuals. To our surprise, the efficiency of iPS cell generation uh, is comparable regardless of the ages of donors. So we can generate iPS cells even from like 80 year old women with a comparable efficiency with, uh, with neonate. So this is what uh, we should be able to do with these patient specific iPS cells. Uh, we could use these cells in toxicology, making disease models, drug screening. A good, a good example of such applications, in vitro application, is uh, QT prolonged syndrome, which is uh, uh, an arrhythmia. Uh, uh, eva uh, uh, diagnosed by elongated QT in EKG. This is induced by many drugs, many common drugs, and some individuals are sensitive to many drugs. Some of them, some of those patients have a known gene mutation, but uh, in other patients, uh, we don't know about genetic mutation, but there should be some genetic abnormalities in those sensitive individuals. QT syndrome often results in this uh, lethal arrhythmia. So if this happens, it's, not, it's terrible to patients and it's also terrible to the drug company who developed uh, that new uh, medicines because they, in many cases, they have to withdraw these uh, drugs. So we really want to predict the occurrence of this uh, QT syndrome and other cardiac toxicity. The best way at the moment may be to ask those patients or uh, sensitive individuals to do this kind of test, to take their EKG and to apply uh, new drug candidates. But of course, this is a very dangerous, risky test. This patient may undergo uh, lethal arrhythmia. So uh, usually we cannot perform this kind of dangerous test. But by using iPS cells, all we have to ask is a small skin biopsy from this patient then we can make iPS cells, we can expand those iPS cells, and we can make beating cardiac myocytes. And then uh, we can uh, uh, test any new drugs on, in the Petri dish by using these iPS cell-derived cardiac myocytes, having the same genetic information with these sensitive uh, patients. So I hope this, this kind of technology will be available very soon, probably uh, in this year, in, in the States and in Japan as well. So of course, in the future, we would like to use these patient-specific iPS cells in cell therapy. And many papers have been published showing therapeutic potentials of both mouse and human iPS cells. We have a collaboration with Keio University, and we showed that mouse and actually human iPS cells derived uh, neurospheres, neurostem cells, uh, can be e e effective in spinal cord injury model mouse. So uh, if we use patient-specific iPS cells in regenerative medicine, we can avoid uh, ethical issue regarding the usage of human embryos, and also we can avoid immune rejection after transplantation. However, 
making iPS cells from each patient is very uh, expensive and also very time consuming. In the case of spinal cord injury, we have to transplant uh, e iPS cell derived neural, neural spheres uh, within seven to 10 days after the injury. However, uh, it takes at least a month to make iPS cells. It takes another month to expand, and it takes another month, month to make uh, neural differentiation from iPS cells. So we can never make it. To, to solve these challenges, we are proposing to make iPS cell bank, just like a blood bank. So instead of patients in this uh, uh, iPS cell bank, we would like to make iPS cells from healthy volunteers. How about HLA? Well, we found, we calculated that if we can identify 50 individuals having unique HLA homozygous alleles for the major three loci, A, B, and D, R, uh, those iPS cells would cover more than 90% of all the Japanese populations with the perfect match of the, uh, of the major three HLA loci. As a matter of fact, we have identified a person who happens to be a medical student who has uh, a homozygous HLA ario and which is the most common type in Japanese population. And we generated iPS cells from that uh, person and we found that that single iPS cell line covers up to 20% of all the Japanese population with the perfect match of all the three uh, uh, loci. So we are now uh, uh, asking enough funding to establish this uh, iPS cell bank to the, uh, new, to the government, but now that we have the new Japanese government, they are not so, so friendly to scientists. So. <laughs> Uh, we are now having a, a little bit of trouble. So, but to realize uh, therapeutic applications of iPS cells uh, in cell therapy, we have to make sure that iPS, cell, iPS cells are uh, as safe as, at least as safe as uh, uh, human ES cells. So, uh, as you know, uh, NIH uh, uh, said yes to the first clinical trial to Geron, who will use ESL-derived oligodendrocytes to treat patients suffering from uh, spinal cord injuries. And I believe that uh, the highest hurdle for that approval was uh, the safety issue, especially, especially teratoma genesis of transplanted cells. So before transplantation, we induce in vitro directed differentiation into like neural cells, oligodendrocytes, or cardiac myocytes. Then we transplant these differentiated cells into either patients or uh, uh, animal models. But if we still have some undifferentiated cells, we will have uh, teratomas. We don't need like uh, uh, many undifferentiated cells. If we have probably 10 or 100 undifferentiated cells in 1 million differentiated cells, that is that are probably all we need to get teratomas. So uh, we compared IPS, mouse IPS cells and ES cells in terms of teratoma propensity. This uh, was done by a graduate student, Kyoko Miura. So we induced uh, neurosphere differentiation, which was developed by uh, Dr. Hideyuki Okano of Keio University. 
So Kyoko uh, generated primary neural squares and then secondary neural squares from mouse ES and iPS cells. And she found that iPS cells are indistinguishable from ES cells in uh, neural sphere formation and in differentiation into neurons, uh, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes from neural spheres. So ES cells and iPS cells are comparable. We can, she can also make uh, various uh, specific uh, uh, types of neurons as well. So again, iPS cells were comparable to ES cells. She then labeled iPS cells with Venus and then transplanted, transplanted uh, secondary neural spheres into uh, mouse brains. And she found that those iPS cell derived neural spheres uh, can integrate into mouse brains and they can uh, differentiate into mature neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes in vivo, in mouse brains. So again, uh, iPS cells are comparable to ES cells in functional uh, differentiation in, in vivo, in mouse brain. However, after uh, a month or two, she found that some mice develop tumors after transplantation of iPS cell derived uh, neurospheres. We confirmed that these tumors are teratomas consisting of various types of uh, uh, tissues of three germ layers. So uh, in these experiments, uh, almost all iPS cells have nano GFP reporter. So undifferentiated cells are green, but after differentiation, they are not green anymore. Usually, we don't see any uh, green cells in secondary neural spheres. However, we, she found that in some iPS cell clone, we still see GFP positive cells in secondary neural spheres. So she quantified the percentage of GFP positive cells in secondary neural spheres by flow, uh, flow cytometry. And uh, this is the result of ES cells. There is almost no GFP positive cells in uh, neural spheres from ES cells. Uh, we have many iPS cell independent clones, uh, like half of them are equivalent to ES cells, but in the remaining half, we saw significant amount of GFP positive cells, even in secondary neural spheres. And uh, there is a good, this is very reasonable, but there is a good correlation between the size of teratomas and the percentages of GFP positive cells. There, there is a, a, a positive, strong correlation. So the question was, iPS cells are as safe as ES cells? And the answer is uh, yes and no. We found that some iPS cells, some iPS clones are equivalent to ES cells. So they are safe iPS cell clones. But we also have unsafe iPS cell clones which have higher uh, propensity to form teratomas. There are two possibilities. These are safe iPS cell clones, even in these IPS, unsafe iPS cell clones, most of the cells are, are good, but they have a few bad cells within uh, these, these, these clones. The second possibility is that most of the cells in these bad unsafe clones are refractory to differentiate for unknown reason. So there are two possibilities. But we found that even from unsafe iPS cells, we can make good uh, neural differentiation and astrocytes as well as oligodendrocytes. Uh, there is no uh, significant differences between safe iPS cell clones and unsafe iPS cell clones. So this means that 
this uh, uh, second possibility is likely the case. So even in unsafe iPSL clones, there, there must be many good iPS cells, but they also have some bad iPS cells. To prove, to test this possibility, we performed subcloning experiment. So we plated these bad iPS cells at a, a, a cloning uh, a density, at a very low density. So after uh, two weeks, we observed many colonies, and Kyoko picked up individual colonies. She expanded, and they, uh, they look almost, they look all the same, undifferentiated. And of course, they are positive for GFP because they are undifferentiated. Then she tried to, she made uh, secondary neural spheres from these subclones. And we found that some subclones, like number 10, are very good. We have few GFP positive cells in secondary neural spheres. However, in some uh, subclones, like number 17, they are very bad. We saw like more than 30% of cells still are GFP positive. So we have many good subclones and bad subclones from a, a single unsafe iPS cell clone, but by doing sudden blot of, uh, in this case, SOX2 retroviruses, SOX2 transgene, we confirmed that these good subclones and bad subclones are uh, originated from the uh, same progenitor. So they, they are really clone. We then compared gene expression of these good and bad clones by DNA microarray, and we found they're very similar. But we did see some differences. For example, when we looked at the expression of H19, which is a famous imprinted, imprinting gene, we found that uh, we found a difference between good subclones and bad subclones. I'm sorry for this uh, complicated slide, but E stands for ESLs, S stands for safe iPS cell clone, and we have three unsafe iPS cell clone and good uh, subclones and bad subclones for each unsafe iPS cell clone. So as you can see here, uh, in ESLs, in safe iPS cell clones, the expression level of H19 is, uh, is low. By contrast, in most of bad iPS cell clones, the expression of H19 is uh, very high. By contrast, in uh, two of the three unsafe iPS clones, we found that uh, uh, H19 is low, lower in good subclones. So this suggests that uh, these differences between good subclones and bad subclones are caused by some kind of epigenetic differences. So we also found that the origin of iPS cells have strong impact on uh, the quality of iPS cells. So again, this shows the percentages of GFP positive cells in secondary neurospheres. We have generated iPS cells from MEP and adult LT fibroblasts and also adult hepatocytes. And we found that iPS cells from MEF are almost comparable to ES cells. However, uh, many iPS from TTF are not safe. Some iPS TTF are safe. So again, the origin of iPS cell has a strong impact on the safeness of resulting iPS cell clones. So again, uh, we found that some iPS cell clones, mouse iPS cell clones are safe, but some are not safe. They have some minor population, which probably has epigenetic abnormalities. And also we found that origin have strong impact on this phenomenon. How about human iPS cells? Uh, we have to remember that 
uh, in most cases, we establish human iPS cells from adult fibroblasts, which may be equivalent to mouse tail tip fibroblasts, although we don't have tails. So, uh, Kazu uh, evaluated uh, quality of human iPS cells. So he induced differentiation of human iPS cells by removing feeders and by using uh, fibroblast culture conditions for five days. And then, after five days, they, he has reseeded 1.5 million cells per 100 meter dish with feeder cells and with ESL culture conditions. And after 14 days, we observed uh, some ES-like colonies, even after uh, in vitro differentiation. So he has tested many, many independent human iPS cell clones. In uh, uh, each dish represents independent iPS cell clone. And in uh, some dish, we can see only 10 to 20 uh, ES-like colonies. But in other dishes like this, like this, we saw more than 1,000 uh, ES-like colonies, even after uh, in vitro differentiation. So this is a quantification of, of the previous result. He repeated this assay three times for each clone. So uh, these different colors represent triplicate results. This is results of two independent ESL lines. So uh, they only produced a few ES-like uh, colonies after in vitro differentiation. Some human ES cells are comparable to ES cells, but the remaining iPS cells produced many uh, ES like colonies even after in vitro differentiation. So, uh, just like mouse, I think some human ES cells are not safe. They should contain some minor population which uh, minor uh, population of cells which are refractory to differentiation so uh, this is the conclusion of my talk today in order to realize uh, ips cell based cell therapy we really have to establish uniform and complete reprogramming in order to uh, uh, achieve this we really have to determine the best origin of human iPS cells. And also we have to determine the best induction method, uh, best gene delivery method, and best combination of factors to uh, induce uniform and complete reprogramming. And I think what is more important is that we really have to uh, have very good evaluation methods to evaluate quality and safeness of human iPS cells before any applications, not only cell therapy, but also like drug discovery and toxicology, uh, we really have to achieve these goals. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, these young students and fellows in my laboratory. This is my laboratory in Kyoto. I have like 40 uh, uh, people including some uh, strange, uh, weird student like this guy. This is a, a, a boy, boy student. <laughs> and also I have a, a small lab in San Francisco. Uh, it's small, but we all have very good people in San Francisco. With this, I'd like to finish my talk and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Again. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. We have time for some questions. There are microphones in the aisles, so if you'd like to pose a question, please approach the microphone. And here we go. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations for the pioneering work. And I have never heard such an excellent presentation with so many good jokes. <laughs> so the question I have is, in the IPS cells reprogrammed, did you use MIC or other transcription factors that will have reduced the chance of tumor formation? Yes, uh, so although I didn't show you, but we found that chimeric mice 
from iPS cells having weak integration, uh, more than 50% or 60% of those mice develop tumors within one year after birth. So uh, we should not use meek retroviruses. That, that's for sure. So the question is, uh, in the other alternative method of embryonic stem cell formation, uh, the egg itself has some uh, repressing factors which might be missing in this. So you think because of this, there might be higher chance of tumor formation? Uh, that's a good point. We have been working very hard to identify other factors that can replace like MIC, and uh, we, we did find some factors. So we are now testing whether those factors can be very safe compared to MIC or not. And it takes some time because we have to observe those mice for, for a long time, at least a year. Thank you very much. Yeah, just to follow up on, on that question, in your screen for the factors and you have a good assay system, uh, did you find uh, factors which had negative effect? That is, they suppressed uh, IPS generation from other factors. Uh, could those factors uh, be used uh, in situation where we don't want uh, the cells to self-renew? So after identifying those four factors, Kazu did additional experiment in which he tested uh, each of the remaining 20 factors plus the four factors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he did find that some factors do have negative effects. Yeah. Uh, could, those, could, could those factors be useful, for example, yeah, for yes, exactly. yes. yes, thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, great talk. Uh, just a similar question on, uh, you know, if you used episomal vectors that disappear from the cells, um, after, uh, say, reprogramming. Do you think that will have an impact? Because, you know, one of the things in using Lenti or, or some of the integrating vectors is, you know, you don't know if they will turn back on at some point or if that's what's causing this. So uh, we did make mouse iPS cells with uh, plasmid, and we have two types of iPS cells. Uh, one with plasmid integration, so it's like a stable line. Right. But the remaining, we did not detect any uh, uh, plasmid integration, so it's a, a transient expression. So we found that we, we, we made uh, chimeric mice from both types, and we found that even with plas plasmid, if MIC transgene is integrated, it's as dangerous as retroviruses. Right. We observe very high incidence of tumorigenicity. However, uh, from iPS cells without integration, we did not observe a higher incidence of tumorigenicity. So I think it is uh, CMIC integration. I think transient ex expression of CMIC uh, should be okay. But uh, we really have to do a longer observation to make a definite conclusion. And is it only CMIC that's affecting the tumorigenicity, or do you think uh, the other factors are responsible as well? Well, so far, you know, we observed those mice almost two years, but we did not see increased tumorigenicity in mice having uh, 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 insertion of the remaining three factors, OC4, SOX2, and KL4. So CMIC is very uh, dangerous, but the other three factors seem to be okay. 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 Thank you. Let me ask uh, one other question. So you, you showed uh, elegantly the difference between safe and dangerous clones can be identified by doing the separate cloning out, and they come from the same original uh, retrovirally transformed cell. It would seem that, uh, given the H19 results, uh, that, as you said, epigenetics may account uh, for the differences. So have you done a systematic assay uh, of the uh, chromatin structure, for instance, or with DNA methylation to see whether you can identify a whole host of things that are different between good and bad clones? Well, that's exactly what we are now working on. But a student, student, Kyoko, who did this experiment, just moved to another laboratory, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been slowed down a little bit. <laughs> Very good. Well, there will be a reception in the library uh, right now, but let us thank our speaker again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much.